Hi everyone, in this video we're going to prove something that uh, everyone uses when calculating definite integrals, but don't often realize. Barrow's famous rule. As you know, integrating functions of a variable corresponds to calculating areas and differentiating to calculating tangents. Measuring areas and calculating tangents are problems that have been worked on since ancient times. Finding a relationship between these concepts was a key milestone in mathematics. That's why one of the most important results about it is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to show this and prove the second fundamental theorem of calculus, better known as Barrow's Rule. Let's discover the maths. Barrow's rule says that if f is a continuous function defined on a closed interval a, b, and capital F is a primitive of small f, then the integral between a and b of f of x is capital F of b minus capital F of a. We're not going to go into detail about the concepts of integrals, uh, partitions of intervals, uh, lower sums and higher sums and so forth. Just bear in mind that since f is a continuous function defined on a closed interval, f is integrable and therefore assuming that f is a positive function, the integral between a and b of f of x is the area bounded by the graph of f, the x-axis and the vertical lines x equals a and x equals b. In the case where f is not necessarily positive for that integral, we'd add the areas of the parts above the x-axis and take away the areas of the parts below the x-axis. So we'll start with our proof. First consider an x belonging to the closed interval a, b. We know that f is continuous in the interval a, x because it's continuous in the entire interval a, b. So as we've indicated, f is integrable in the interval a, x. Now we'll consider the integral between a and x of f. As we've already used x, we'll choose another variable, which we'll call t. So we have f of t dt, and this will give a real number. As we can do this for any x in the interval a, b, we can define a new function g, defined on the closed interval a, b in R, such that each x corresponds to the integral between a and x of f of t dt. Notice that if we calculate, for example, g at a, we substitute a for x in the expression of g. This will be the integral between a and a of f of t dt, which is zero. And if we calculate g at b, we substitute x for b. Since x no longer appears, we can use the variable x instead of t. This will be the integral between a and b of f of x dx. So g at b is the integral we want to evaluate. Later we'll come back to this. The next step is to calculate the derivative of g to see that g is also a primitive of f. Suppose x is a value in the open interval a, b. Let's compute g prime of x. By the definition of a derivative, this is the limit as h tends to zero of g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. And we're going to calculate the numerator of this fraction. We'll take a value of h greater than zero, which can be as small as we like, because afterwards we'll make h ten to zero. Now consider g of x plus h minus g of x. For g of x plus h, we substitute x plus h for x in g. 
This is the integral between a and x plus h of f of t dt. And then we have minus g of x. We'll copy the expression for g, which is the integral between a and x of f of t dt. Now, x is a value that's between a and x plus h. So the interval a x plus h can be expressed as a union of the intervals ax and x x plus h. Notice that in the first integral, the integration interval is a x plus h. Here we have a decomposition of this. So the first integral is expressed as the sum of two integrals, the integral between a and x plus the integral between x and x plus h. Now take away the integral between a and x of f of t dt. These two elements cancel, and we're left with the integral between x and x plus h of f of t dt. Next, we substitute the value of g of x plus h minus g of x in the calculation of the derivative. The derivative is the limit as h tends to zero of the integral between x and x plus h of f of t dt over h. And now we're going to work with this integral in the numerator. Since we have the integral between x and x plus h of f, we consider f restricted to this interval, that is, f defined in the closed interval x, x plus h in r. We know f is a continuous function and is defined in a closed interval. Applying the extreme values theorem, we have that f is bounded and also that it has absolute minima and absolute maxima. That is, there are x sub little m, x sub big M elements of the interval such that f of x sub m is less than or equal to f of t is less than or equal to f of x sub big M for all t belonging to the interval x, x plus h. Now suppose we call f of x sub small m, small m, and f of x sub large m, large m. If in the chain of inequalities we integrate in that interval, we have that the integral between x and x plus h of small m is less than or equal to the integral in that interval of f, which is less than or equal to the integral in the interval capital M. Notice that this first integral comes out small m, and there would be m for x plus h minus x, which is small m h, and this integral in the same way as capital M for x plus h minus h, which is capital M h. We'll write these elements down here. Since h is positive and not zero, dividing by h all the terms of the inequalities, these inequalities don't change their directions, and we obtain that small m is less than or equal to the integral between x and x plus h of f divided by h, which is less than or equal to capital M. Substituting the m's, we have that f of x sub small m is less than or equal to this quotient, which is less than or equal to f of x sub large m. f is a continuous function defined in the closed interval x, x plus h, and we have that this quotient is between the minimum and maximum values that f reaches in this interval. So, applying the intermediate values theorem, there'll be a c sub h belonging to this interval such that f of c sub h will be equal to the integral between x and x plus h of f of t dt divided by h. Substituting this above, we have the limit when h tends to zero, and notice that this is the quotient that we've calculated. 
then we substitute for the result f of c sub h, whereas we know c sub h belongs to the interval x, x plus h. Now, very important, since f is a continuous function, the limit goes inside the f, that is, f of the limit when h tends to 0 of c sub h. So, this remains f of, and what happens now? Of course, when h tends to 0, x plus h tends to x. So this interval approaches the set formed simply by the point x. But c sub h is within this interval. Therefore, c sub h will tend to x. So this limit is x. And we've arrived at the result g prime of x is equal to f of x. Great. It's important to note that although it wasn't our goal, we've proved the fundamental theorem of integral calculus. g is this integral, and its derivative is f, the integrand. We've shown that by deriving an integral, we obtain what appears inside the integral, which means that the derivative and the integral are inverse operators. We have that g prime of x is f of x, which means that g is a primitive of f. But by hypothesis, we also have that capital F is a primitive of small f. So we know that f of x equals g of x plus k for some real number k. And this is where we're working, that is in the closed interval ab. Now, if we evaluate at x equals a, we have that f at a equals g at a plus k. But as we indicated before, g at a by the definition of g is the integral between a and a of f, which is 0. Then g at a, which is 0, plus k is just k. Therefore, k equals f at a, from which f of x equals g of x plus k which is f at a. The only thing left is to evaluate this expression at x equals b. We have that f at b equals g at b plus f at a. From this, f at b minus f at a equals g at b, which by the definition of g is the integral between a and b of f. Reading from right to left, we obtain that the integral between a and b, the variable x will not appear, then we can change the variable t for x, of f of x dx. This is capital F at b minus capital F at a, as we wanted to demonstrate. Fantastic! Well, we've achieved another new goal on our channel. On the internet, you'll find thousands of videos that use Barrow's rule in calculating integrals, but very few that justify it. As you know, one of the main goals on our channel here at Discover Maths is that you don't just use rules uh, that you've learned, but that you understand the maths behind them. And that's what we're trying to do. Anyway, I hope you found this useful. Please subscribe to us if you haven't already, and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.